our seminar this afternoon. We're very much looking forward to it. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been to one of our seminars before, this is the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre here at London Met. We are a relatively new centre. We set up in September of last year. And uh, we have a very exciting program of seminars. And this is one of four seminars uh, during this term. So we have um, several more events happening through May and June. The details about our forthcoming seminars are on the Research Centre website. If I could just take a moment to um, let you know about those events that are coming up. We've got um, seminars coming up on how to get published, which is a workshop at the 25th of May. Then we have a very exciting event which is taking place uh, in partnership with another centre here at London Met on reorientating cultural creativity and that will be taking place uh, towards the end of May. Then we have a very exciting book launch which will take place on the 10th of June on climate, the climate crisis and gender inequality. And then our final event will take place, which Maria is coordinating on the 16th of June, which is about journalism and human rights with a focus on Mexico. So a very diverse programme of seminars coming up through May and June. And we very much hope that you'll attend some of those um, events as well. So without further ado, I'm now going to uh, get us started for today's event, which is entitled Perspectives on Nationalism and Populism. We've got two speakers today. The first speak I'll introduce them um, as they're about to speak. So our first speaker uh, is Angelos. Um, I know you told me how to pronounce it, Angelos, but now I'm stumbling over it again. Uh, Chris, Chris Orgelos, is it? Angelos? Yep. 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 Sorry. Thank you. And uh, his paper is entitled Populism and Democracy After COVID-19, Old Divides and New Challenges for Liberal Democracy. Um, Angelos will speak first and then our second speaker, Professor Alistair Ross, will speak after that. Mm -hmm. And what we normally do at these events is we have both presentations back to back. And then after that, we will have a uh, time for questions. If during the presentation, a question occurs to you, please do type it in the chat. And then when both speakers have finished, I can either read out questions in the chat or, of course, you are very welcome to turn your microphone on and ask your brief question uh, in person. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to my colleague Angelos, who's a lecturer in politics and international relations in the School of Social Sciences and also a member of the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Centre. Over to you, Angelos. Uh... Thank you, Luis. Oh, great. Brilliant. Uh, that's actually, uh, so this is the, um, so yeah, this is a presentation. Sorry, the, the title appears slightly different to the one that I was, uh, to the one that I was, uh, that, that was given in the program, but it, it pretty much captures what it is that I want to, what is that I want to, uh, what is that I want to say. Um, so, Essentially, what I'm trying to do in this presentation, which is something that I've been uh, thinking for a while, is how exactly can we think about how two major crises that are uh, engulfing uh, liberal democracy currently, um, and the world, I would argue, how do they interrelate uh, with each other? So we are obviously living, living currently in uh, a major disruption of our lives, of the economic life, of our social lives, uh, with the rise of uh, with the pandemic, which, as we see all around us, has basically uh, upended many ways that uh, our societies work. And honestly, I don't think, despite all kinds of speculations that are being made, Currently, I don't think anyone really um, can be certain about how uh, the things will unfold uh, in the future. But we do know that uh, a, a big part of our lives, whether it's working patterns, whether it's uh, the structure of the economy, uh, will mm, change significantly moving forward. How we travel, you know, tourism, you, you name it. 
Uh, and I think that uh, one thing that also we should keep in mind on that is that as those things change, also the underlying principles and structures of political representation will uh, change. If, our, if people's economic lives change, if people's work lives change, if their life opportunities change, then that uh, inevitably will flow into a question about uh, the, how they vote uh, and also how democratic systems work. Now, the point, of course, is that be well before the pandemic, we actually were in the middle of this debate, in the middle of this conversation, which centered around the concept of, um, of uh, populism, right, which was understood as a multifaceted crisis of uh, democracy. There was a very vibrant debate about why we experienced the rise of populism in many uh, liberal democracies, as well as many emerging democracies in the global south. So populism seemed to be a feature both of mature Western liberal democracies and of uh, democracies in the global south, um, or, or, or of mass systems, not necessarily liberal democracies as such, but the systems in any case with a strong mass electoral uh, electoralized um, component. So then the question becomes, how do these two crises uh, interact and how other would they be expected to affect the, um, uh, the functioning of democracy moving forward. There have already been some uh, first kind of uh, assessments. Uh, you know, it was very common to hear that, you know, populists were not really good at managing the pandemic. We saw how uh, the situation in the United States unfolded with uh, President Trump. Uh, but we also see that uh, more recently that non-populist countries are not necessarily any better at managing some other aspects of the pandemic. We can think, for example, of the problems that that the EU has experienced with its vaccine rollouts. So the verdict is still pretty much open, I would say, about what the pandemic means about the development of populism and democracies moving forward. So I'm just going to offer some uh, assessments or, or some guesses, rather, in this presentation, rather than uh, firm, uh, rather than firm uh, predictions. Uh, how does this move forward? Yeah. So just a just a just a just a basic. Uh, whoop, Sorry. Yeah. So just a basic kind of uh, definition about what is uh, what is populism. Uh, there are many definitions attached to um, uh, the concept of uh, populism, uh, but generally, uh, despite of the specific differences, we generally understand uh, populism as a mode of politics that tends to be quite a uh, binary, uh, quite uh, antagonistic. It's the kind of politics that usually divides uh, politics and society in an us versus uh, them. And, you, and the us versus them in populism is defined in terms of a virtuous people people versus a corrupt uh, elite. Uh, so usually populism uh, takes many different forms. Uh, the people and the elite can be defined in many different ways. We commonly say that, for example, right-wing populism would define the us, the good people, and the corrupt elites, the corrupt outsiders in ethnic terms uh, uh, or in national terms, whereas left-wing populism would do that in the class terms. So we, the people down here, the downtrodden versus the rich, powerful elites. Uh, up there. There's also a pretty big debate about whether populism is good or bad for the for um, the um, uh, for democracy. Uh, it, it, this here it really depends on kind of it's, it's really on the eye of the beholder about what exactly you want to emphasize. Um, detra det detractors of populism usually point to the fact that it tends to be a very emotional, a very charged uh, rhetoric. Uh, they charge populism with what they call anti-pluralism, uh, this idea that if you're not with us, you're against us. Uh, so populism doesn't really tolerate, um, uh, doesn't really tolerate um, uh, overlapping or cross-cutting uh, cleavages or cross-cutting allegiances. So in that sense, it is uh, it is seen as going against the, the idea that a modern society is inherently pluralistic, where people, many people, can feel many different things, or feel that they belong to different uh, to different groups, and many different groups are legitimated in comp competing to have their preferences uh, heard. Uh, populism usually has a much more direct and what could say Manichian view uh, of the world.
On the other hand, populism is also seen as a positive. Uh, populism is seen as a force of democracy. Populism is about bringing in the views of the people uh, or the uh, desires of those who are unrepresented, uh, as particularly against kind of more technocratic governance, right? So the idea is that populism kind of brings the people into a political system that is usually quite um, that is usually quite uh, stale or only works in a certain uh, has learned to work uh, in a certain uh, in a certain way. What are some of the main uh, explanations for the rise of populism? Uh, conventionally, we say that right-wing populism has usually grown from uh, concerns. Uh, actual concerns or concerns that have been stoked by right-wing populists about immigration. Uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was the leader of the French, uh, of the Front National in France, is considered the archetypical uh, far-right, uh, radical-right uh, populist. Um, you see here also a poster, an infamous poster that was used years ago by the Swiss uh, Populist Party. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the poster is for more security, and as you can see, the white sheep are kicking out of Switzerland. You can see the red and the white cross there, uh, the black sheep, which is kind of a very racialized uh, understand, you know, kind of it's uh, um, a very racialized and very kind of obvious uh, understanding about how they understand the virtuous people and the outsiders. Uh, populism can also emerge out of economic crisis, and that is the case with so-called left-wing populists, so, such as Alexis Tsipras in Greece and uh, Pablo Iglesias of Podemos in uh, Spain, both of whom emerged out of a major economic crisis, the, the Eurozone crisis that happened in the previous decade in their countries, and they basically seized the opportunity to redefine the economic crisis as a crisis of political representation, saying that the people are not, um, are not uh, heard. Those explanations about the rise of populism give also specific kind of a rise to specific families. The most famous populist family, and usually what most people have in mind when they hear about populism in Europe is about the far right or what we call the populist radical right. Um, it is, we see here the leader of the populist radical right in Austria, in France, Marine Le Pen, who's the daughter of Jean-Marie Le Pen, and, and Sweden. So they're spread in uh, many parts of Europe. Um, the populist radical right defines the people in exclusive ethnic uh, terms. Uh, so it is it, it it puts forward what we call a nativism, which isn't simply nationalism in the sense that you believe in your country, but a more exclusive understanding of who belongs to the country, which usually tends to be very uh, racialized and uh, tends to be uh, kind of uh, very ethnic. Uh, usually these people put forward an idea that only native inhabitants of the country are entitled to belonging to the real uh, people. They also emphasize national sovereignty and uh, your skepticism. Uh, the populist left, on the other hand, uh, we see here some examples of that, Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn was also considered a left-wing populist, which kind of shows you how malleable the term populism is. And what it ultimately means is that uh, really at its core, populism really means a mode of politics that emphasizes we the people versus the elites who don't listen to us. But this can take many different trajectories depending on the issues that they that they uh, focus on. So the populist left, obviously, also like the populist right that likes to talk about the people, but the way they understand the people is fundamentally, uh, is fundamentally different. The populist left emphasizes particularly questions of the economy rather than nativism and um, ethnicity. There's also some recent uh, phenomena, such as Beppe Grillo, who was a comedian, and he started a populist uh, party in Italy, the Five Star Movement. And here, what I find, th what I think is particularly interesting, moving now slowly into the question of the pandemic, is why exactly is uh, why exactly is uh, populism uh, kind of some uh, we would, could call cultural uh, dimensions of populism, perhaps not purely political, but they are quite. Uh, 
quite important. Um, some elements, some uh, elements of populism tend to be quite prone to conspiracies. They tend to be quite um, suspicious of science because populism is suspicious of uh, suspicious of authority, is suspicious of um, is suspicious uh, of uh, elites, is suspicious of experts. Therefore, it also tends to be uh, suspicious of science to the extent that it sees science as a part of an elite narrative that tries to keep the people uh, down. Um, the five star movement of Beppe Grillo was always internet driven. We now live in a world, we have this presentation through the internet, but uh, the five star movement already 10 years ago made a big fuss of the fact that it is an internet based democracy where members can basically vote on the party's platforms and the party's policies directly through the uh, internet. And of course, this also feeds into this idea that people are suspicious of institutions. Uh, usually, institutions are things that we see around us, the things that we believe belong to, you know, in a way institutions embody uh, society. So this trend towards an internet life that we have right now, paradoxically, also fits into this mode of uh, populism whereby people don't really have a direct relationship with their uh, parties or with their politics, but they rather make themselves heard or they make themselves present through this unmediated internet relationship with uh, a strong uh, leader. I think this has interesting uh, implications for uh, the future mm, as well. The Gilets Jaunes in France was also an example of this uh, populism from uh, populism from below, which is quite amorphous. It can take many different ideological colorings. So again, uh, populism can have can take many different uh, shapes and forms. So uh, why did, was populism emerging in previous uh, years? Uh, there's this idea that populism emerges out of economic crisis or it emerges out of concerns with immigration, again, depending on whether it gives rise to left-wing or right-wing populism, or sometimes those two things mold together in a single anti-systemic um, anti -systemic, uh, uh, anti -systemic politi uh, political message. However, I think uh, ultimately pop populism really reflects a crisis of political representation. Whether it's an economic crisis or an immigration quote-unquote crisis or any other crisis that uh, we uh, face or, you know, uh, the COVID-19 could be such a uh, crisis, I see those crises primarily as catalysts rather than causes. I think that uh, they don't really cause the rise of populism as such, but what they do is that they, cre uh, they uh, bring to the for the idea that people don't feel represented or, or don't feel at home at their, within their um, democratic representative uh, systems. And part of the reason of this, I think, is the fact that uh, we live in a world that is very interconnected. As we see with the pandemic, a lot of responses require both strong transnational cooperation as well as cooperation with non-political bodies, experts. We now see that essentially uh, pharmaceutical companies have become direct interlocutors of government. What this means is that basically traditional channels of representation really break down and it becomes quite unclear what citizens can control and how citizens can control decisions made uh, for them. I usually, talking about populism in Europe, I usually often like to show this graph here which um, showcases how the uh, EU works and you know in such a political system uh, which is notoriously complicated it is very very difficult for the citizen to find out what exactly they control or how their vote really matters and I argue that within this sense of the democratic impotence or representational impotence, the idea that we're not being heard or that issues and decisions go way beyond the realm of uh, popular accountability, that populism steps in and offers this idea that people can take back control as the famous slogan had it. So, by the way, what I find really interesting is how, precisely because the EU is such a notoriously complicated system, it was always easy for the EU to blame uh, others or to blame other uh, different elements of the EU, to blame other elements inside the EU about uh, the uh, problems it had with its vaccine rollout uh, earlier, uh, earlier this year. Which brings me overall now to the question about how do we expect um, those uh, dynamics of the pandemic to uh, interact with the question of populism. 
actually think I see three major changes taking place uh, in the um, in the world uh, on account of the pandemic. Uh, what I call a stronger state, uh, technology becoming a political and social divide, uh, technology and science becoming essentially part of uh, um, uh, becoming politicized, and a stronger uh, China. And let's see one by one how those can be expected to interact with uh, questions of uh, populism. So, first of all, a stronger state. Uh, I think we were moving towards this already a certain way, but what we see is that the economic management of the consequences of the pandemic have basically ripped apart the old neoliberal consensus that the state should do as little as possible in the economy. We actually see the state now taking over new powers, not only in terms of fiscal powers, in terms of spending money, uh, but we also see new demands for uh, controlling borders, uh, not, both in the sense of protecting um, ec our exports in order to keep uh, medical equipment and other critical supplies, or in this case, in our case, vaccines uh, within our sovereignty, uh, as well as controlling who comes in on account of uh, hygienic, uh, hygienic uh, reasons. Uh, the state will uh, very, very soon uh, acquire new powers of control uh, over us in terms of uh, track and tracing, uh, see, tracing our movements, again, for presumably to control uh, our health. But overall, we see a very, very strong, uh, very, very strong expansion of mm, state powers over our everyday, over our everyday uh, lives. And while this takes place because of the pandemic, of course, the question is, what does it do to the previous message of populism, which was that political power should do more to control non political forces that seem to be challenging the sovereignty of the state and the sovereignty uh, of the people. One could argue that we are moving already into a space that is already vindicating a bit the populist message about uh, political power controlling lives in one way, in one way uh, or uh, other. So it's open whether this would actually benefit uh, populists uh, in the future because we are already speaking their language uh, in a way. Uh, populism already before the pandemic was interacting with important questions about uh, technology. We already we all know the stories about Trump and his uh, Facebook uh, ads uh, or uh, Cambridge Analytica, questions of uh, the big tech platforms, social media, um, big data, uh, policing hate speech on the internet, how those places, those platforms actually work as uh, sources of political influence. These are all very important things, uh, of course. We also know, however, that during the pandemic, the role of the big tech has increased significantly, right? I mean, we are on Zoom right now, uh, we're using Amazon, Amazon, we're using uh, we're using uh, Deliveroo. We we'll probably spend much more time on our uh, on our uh, social media. Again, these are platforms that play a very very important role in, for democracy, and they have only just become stronger because of the pandemic. So again, the question is, how would this uh, affect the role of populists who already seem to be benefiting from this development before the uh, pandemic? Finally, China has become a much more important actor because of the pandemic. We know we know that already China was become was on the rise, but uh, the pandemic has driven the point home. Both because China was the source of uh, the coronavirus, but also because China has also presented a strong initial model about managing the consequences of the. Uh, coronavirus. So China will become an important domestic political issue uh, in the years to come. The question is, what does that do to populism? We have a, a, an example already of the case of Russia, um, a country that has become part of domestic politics, and we know that populists are definitely feel close generally feel closer to Russia in most Western democracies. But the question is, would China become this kind of authoritarian spoiler of the democratic game? Trump already has shown an example that actually populists may feel more comfortable targeting China as a evil, as a villain, rather than aligning with China, as many populists felt that they could do with Russia. So still, it's also quite open how exactly the balls will fall with regard to how populists will view China. But I think China will feature much more in the rhetoric of populists one way or the other moving forward. So the question now is then, uh, and I'm coming to a close here, how exactly do we see those pandemic trends influence 
uh, influencing uh, populism. Uh, I think there's various uh, trends uh, here. Uh, there's this idea that we see now that, uh, you know, we hear about the stimulus, uh, Joe Biden's stimulus, this idea that the more activist role of the state is enough for actually societies to feel again in place with their, um, with their political system. The idea is that the pandemic has kind of catalyzed uh, this idea that uh, governments need to do more in the economy. It was an idea that was growing well before the pandemic, partly because of Trump's victory uh, in the US and concerns with globalization. The question is, A, will it be enough? Uh, are, is, the economic, um, is the economic harm that we've seen because of lockdowns and the management of the pandemic over the last year and a half, uh, will government support be enough to undo the damage? Or actually, will we see a slow burning rise of political disenchantment because of economic disruption? I should remind you that in the previous economic financial crisis in 2008, by 2016, based on the numbers, the US economy had rebounded and had made up most of the losses, both in terms of unemployment and GDP, from the financial crisis. Yet there were still enough disgruntled people to vote for Trump. So I would argue that the real economic and therefore political effect of the pandemic will take years to boil over to see what it will produce in terms of political uh, disruption. Um, there's also, to me, another very interesting development is the politicization of uh, science. Uh, earlier in the year, last year, where there was a lot of politicization around face masks. Uh, you know, is face mask a sign of freedom or is our face mask a sign of, you know, trusting science? Now there's all this, uh, there's all this uh, um, speculation around, um, around the vaccines. Uh, I think there's, uh, we see here a clash of two ideas about how our democratic debate should be organized, which is this uh, kind of this idea that we should quote unquote trust science, which I'm, I'm quite in favor of that. But I think uh, as a, in principle, but as a political idea, trust in science can be perceived by many people as also a way to um, to kind of ossify uh, or freeze uh, democratic debates around things. Populism thrives when the populism basically thrives on consensus. Let's put it that way. Populism thrives not only democratic political consensus, populism thrives on technocratic apolitical consensus. The idea that we cannot talk about things because science says so, because experts say so. And uh, as we see now with the pandemic, experts actually don't really have ready-made solutions to any of the problems, which actually makes sense because science isn't really meant to provide clear-cut answers. Science is basically a program of inquiry basically posing itself new questions. So what I would argue this politicization of the trust science uh, slogan, which I, by, by the way, believe, you know, I've had my COVID vaccine and everything, don't get me wrong, uh, but I've had my COVID vaccine as an informed citizen making sense of risks and uh, benefits on the basis of me making sense of the news. This idea that people should be told by science what to do essentially freezes off democracy, and I would argue it is also very problematic for the rise of populism uh, in the future. So to conclude, will the pandemic help populists? I think it's very early to tell, extremely early to tell. All I would note, however, is that every crisis has its populism. Um, there's, this, there's this trend for people to say, oh, Trump lost the election, uh, populists in other countries are not doing well, Bolsonaro in Brazil, therefore the pandemic hurts populists. I think this is way too early to tell. I think this is a very kind of simplistic way of putting it. We already see that despite early struggles with the pandemic, Marine Le Pen is again leading the polls in France. So already we see that the disruption of the pandemic is already helping old school populists. But I would actually say that every crisis has populism in the sense that every crisis puts forward new demands. And I think this mix of uh, disgruntlement with the management of the pandemic by some people, distrust of science, uh, this idea that science provides all the answers, and when science fails to provide the answers, then people instinctively feel that they've been cheated uh, by the uh, elites and the politicization of technology, I think they create a very volatile new mix, which would, we should pre expect that it should give rise to a pretty unique new type of uh, populism. But what is certain is that it will take many, many years for it to percolate and for it to uh, appear. Just because it won't appear immediately doesn't mean that this crisis will not generate its own kind of uh, populism and anti-systemic politics moving forward. Thank you, Angelus. Excellent.
excellent. Uh, wow, there's just so much there for, for us to, to start to think about and to digest. So thank you for that really thought provoking and, and in some ways quite provocative presentation. And just as you were talking, I was thinking about the kind of very um, fuzzy role of experts. So if you think back to Brexit and Michael Gove's famous assertion that we've had enough of experts, we don't need experts to tell us what to think. And then switching to the pandemic where we absolutely have to be led by the science and we need scientists to, to tell us exactly what to do. So politicians can play the science card in different ways when it suits them. So I, I found your presentation really engaging. So I can see that people have started to type questions in the chat. So if I could ask colleagues to continue to type questions um, and we will now move on to our second speaker and we will come back to themes raised by Angelos after we have heard from our next speaker who is um, our colleague Professor Alistair Ross and Alistair's presentation is entitled Young Europeans Perspectives on Nationalism. So Alistair over to you. Alistair, we can't actually hear you at the moment. I can see your lips are moving, but we can't hear anything. Are you on mute, Alistair? No, I, I can't hear Alistair. I don't know if it's just me. Maria, can you hear Alistair? No? No, no, we no, can't hear no. you, Alistair. No, sorry, Alistair, we've got this problem again. We had this problem um, earlier and we thought we'd managed to fix it. Do you want to try again, Alistair? No, I can see your lips are moving, but I cannot hear you. Sorry. No. No. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. 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 So yes. maybe, um, yes. Right, I got yeah, the, I, perfect. Yeah, okay, fine. And I'm loud enough for you. Yes, okay. That's perfect. Uh, Thank fine. you, Alistair. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry for that delay. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you in a moment. Um, I'm controlling it from my end. Uh, and I'm going to play my. There we go. Um, okay, I hope you can all see that. Um, yes, I'm we can all see it yeah, perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Young people in their teenage years, basically, is the focus of the work that I've been doing. And I'm going to look at today at the kind of stuff they said about nationalism. Um, I'm going to start off, though, with a um, somewhere else, Revolutionary France in 1792. Um, when the the Prussians decided that they were going to invade and put down this insurrection, and the two armies met together at Vlamy on the 20th of September 1792. The, the uh, French advanced to the sounds of uh, Vive la Nation, Sang Saira, and um, marched in the name of the French nation. Now, what was interesting was that there was an observer from the um, uh, the state of, um, uh, where is he from? Saxe Weimar Einach, um, by the name of Goethe. Goethe, the famous writer, poet, um, was a military observer at this battle for the, the Duke of Saxe Weimar Einach. The troops from Prussia were defeated by the French, um, and Goethe that evening um, tried to console his compatriots and said, to them from here and today begins a new epoch of world history and you can say you witnessed it and what he was talking about was the fact that the army the French army had moved in the name of the nation rather than of um, the ruler of the nation um, and he thought this was a very significant transition change from the way that people were being mobilized a new epoch in world history um, unknown to Goethe, on the very same day, the, the French National Assembly um, declared itself France to be a civil state. Um, and from that moment on, individuals existed as citizens in France um, because they were registered by the authorities to be citizens, to be nationals of the territory. 
Um, but I want to raise problems around the idea of the nation state and the nation. Um, it's a term that's been used greatly by political scientists, um, particularly American political scientists. Um, and Louis Halley says a private pact about the world is composed of nation states. Um, Rastow wrote of the world of nations and the nations he cited included this, the um, United States and um, the UK, both of which would be decidedly difficult to classify as simple nation states, certainly. And um, Walker Connor tried to um, analyze states in 1971 and suggested that in about 30% of the states, the largest group, the largest national group, was less than half the population. And in a further quarter, it was between a quarter, three quarters and a half the population. Um, and in, in fact, 90%, 80% of the states, um, the population from the major ethnic group was, 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 was less than 90%, always. Um, so, and we've had since then um, a lot of work on the idea that nations are constructs, they are devices devised by individuals um, and from Benedict Anderson onwards he talked about imagined communities. They had their own particular narrative power he says because even the smallest nation will never know their fellow members, meet them or hear of them. It's imagined, it's limited and it's finite, it's elastic and it has boundaries that are not particularly precise. And we've had people writing about this, the invention of states and the invention of traditions, um, Eric Red, Hobbes, Norman, Terry Ranger onwards, um, writing about Western Europe and most closely, um, Hoskins and Shoplin writing about the, the Eastern European countries and the myths of nationhood there, and very recently in the Collie um, writing this month. Um, I've not read all of it yet, um, but she makes the point that actually we've even before the current situation, we've had most places comprised of empires or empire states rather than of nation states. Um, so there's some problems around the idea of the nation, I think. I'm trying to discover what the, um, we, can, we can say about um, what young Europeans um, say about nations and how they see themselves as being nationals or members of a citizens or members of a state in some way or not. Um, and I'm working partly from the ideas that Mary Fulbrook um, put around in this book, Distant Dissonant Lives. She looked at uh, the German dictatorships that, um, and the German states through the 19th and 20th centuries um, and suggest that, suggested that you can explain a lot of the politics by looking at generations and the generations that had common experiences. And the age, she says, at which people experience key historical moments in Philbrook studies, this German society in those three moments particularly, um, can be very critical in terms of what happens in terms of the politics. Age, she says, is crucial at times of transition, respect to the ways in which people can become involved in new regimes and societies. Um, and the age which she was focusing on very much was people in their teens and in their early 20s. She says, when you're socialized, or when you acquire the trappings, the understanding of your society at that age, you become particularly informed in ways that actually last with you on a cohort basis right the way through your, 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 your political life. Um, these key formative experiences, though, don't necessarily produce the same outcomes, but they produce some common challenges at a particular life stage and leave unresolved issues that give you generational differences. So I was looking particularly at um, young people in their teens in the period from about 2010 to 2018 onwards. Um, and those people had, I thought, some particularly common political experiences that were different from those of their parents. They were young Europeans, both within the notion of the changing idea of citizenship in Europe and also within the states that had 
emerged, had changed, whether East or West European, since the, the fall of the wall. Um, it really comes back to what Napoleon again was saying, perhaps this is, an, a, a, I think, a very a, 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 a apocryphal statement. Um, to understand the man, you have to know what was happening in the world when he was 20. Um, I found this statement from Napoleon quoted in many academic works and popular works, and I cannot find anywhere any attribution that actually says he may have spoken it, but if you know one, no one, please let me know. Um, so there have been some formative experiences um, that have affected young people in that group. Um, from the Tinderman's report onwards, um, which was right back in 76, and he was talking about Europe trying to have a common good, a new kind of society, a democratic union with a greater sense of solidarity and humanity. Um, that took more shape in Maastricht when the idea of a Europe, European citizenship came about. Article 8, citizenship of the union is established. Everyone holding the nationality of a member state is a citizen of the union. And union citizens enjoy particular rights conferred by that treaty and have duties imposed upon them. Um, there you can see the group at Maastricht, um, Britain playing quite a prominent role in that. You can see John Major there on the right hand side. Um, um, and there they are today um, without a Brit in view. And that was treat, that um, Maastricht definition was modified slightly at Lisbon. Citizenship of the Union was explained as additional to national citizenship and the word national creeps in there again. This model of European political identity is symbolic. It takes the constructivist view of national identity that Anderson and Gellner and co were bringing forward from the, from the 1980s, which is a challenge to the primordialist view of the national nation being a real essential construct based on common roots, common heritage, um, birthplace traditions, rituals, language, religion, and so on. Primordialists see nations as being ancient and natural, but as brass, I was pointing out a long time ago, there are very few groups in the world today whose members can lay any serious claim to that. It's not an actual descent, it's a belief, belief in a common descent. So my question was, um, if individuals construct their concept like nation, na national nationalism in a social setting, and it's an activity that's contingent upon the circumstances in which those concepts are expressed, and most young people of a school age particularly difficult to ask questions about this, not because they can understand it, but because they are accustomed to being asked questions by adults that are testing their knowledge. There's a growing flaw in the school systems across the world that the language that schools use, the language that teachers use with their students is to test them rather than to explore ideas with them. So my approach was rather different. I didn't want to go into questionnaires. I didn't want to go into interviews. I wanted to have small deliberative discussions, um, usually about 50 minutes long with a small group of young people, five to eight people in that age range, and discuss things with them using their own vocabulary. So I asked extremely open-ended questions, largely in response to what they'd said and using their terms. I tried not to introduce terms like country, nation, state, but to get them to talk about their location and then to, when they use the word like nation or a word like state or country, I would come back to them with questions based around that and get them to explain what they meant. And it was a distinctly unstructured approach and that, uh, to the appearance of the people taking part, um, designed to capture, use the narratives that they themselves used. Um, and to get them to talk between themselves so I could see how they were socially constructing these ideas between themselves rather than having a dialogue with me. So I tried to keep out of the conversation as much as possible and encourage them to discuss and argue between themselves. This is in some sense part of the a, a, a German epistemological, um, a, a methodological process that's um, been devised over the last 20 years called group discussion work. Um, open interviews, they develop a topic in their own language, their own vocabulary, 
they're in the symbolic system. So it avoids me, the, inter in the, the organizer, or the, the originator of the group, um, giving them terms that they have to feel they have to structure themselves around, um, letting them choose the terms that they want to use. It can be very flexible, um, much more flexible than focus groups can be. And it's trying to look at the knowledge stock that they have themselves um, that's not necessarily on the surface in a more formal conversation, um, something which is perhaps a little bit beneath the surface. So it's essentially looking at how they share ideas with each other rather than with me. So I wanted to establish a sense of agency. So the discussion appeared at least to be directed and paced by the group themselves. So I told them there were no right answers. They should say if they disagree between themselves. Um, I didn't introduce leading terminology. I tried to make my questions very open. So if someone said they were French, I would say something like, what makes you French? Which is a demanding, unusual question without, with clearly without a right, correct answer. And when I did that, you get a whole variety of different explanations why they feel French and they debate between themselves the merits, demerits of those particular things. I tried not to say that anything was wrong or to query it in a way that implied I thought it was wrong. So I was trying to get everyone to feel free that they could respond and to keep asking questions that responded to what they'd said and to get them to expand upon that and try to get myself out of the picture as far as possible. So it wasn't a serial interview where I went round the entire group, each person giving a question. They spoke as they wanted to, um, very few rules about that. Um, and they talked between themselves more than to me, I hoped. It usually worked, not always. Um, so not a sequential interview. And I kept asking for, what do you mean by that? Can you give an example of that um, to try and get them to talk further? Um, I gathered data. I'd retired by this stage, so this explains how, I could do, how I've done this, um, from a large number of states across Europe um, over the period 2010, first of all, 2014, when I was looking particularly at the Eastern European states that had recently joined the European Union and the states that were candidate states at that time. So the blue ones there are the, the, the new members states, the yellow ones there were in 2010 candidate states um, to join the European Union. And I tried to find locations that were not simply the capital city, but large and small settlements across the territories. Um, so that I got a, a reasonable range of views that represented not simply the metropolitan elite, but much more broadly based um, types of community than simply that. Um, one of the major criticisms of much social studies, much um, sociological and work in those, in those areas um, is that they tend to go very much for people who are um, easily to reach, easy to reach in the, in the university cities, often the psychology courses, um, and they tend to be overwhelmingly female, those psychology courses, um, and they then have that result from that quite small social set um, explained as the way the nation, whole country behaves. So, after 2012, I wrote a book and then decided I should go further than that. And from 14 on to 2016, 2017, um, began looking um, at the, the older European states and the, the economic community, the, the um, economic area states, um, um, and ended up having been to 29 countries, I think it was, um, but 103 different locations. Um, and 2,000 young people in all in those groups. So it's a vast data bank that I transcribed um, of conversations, as I say, each about an hour long. I did this, I organized this um, by having um, many colleagues and friends across Europe who organized little areas for me in each particular city. I, uh, one would, someone would volunteer and they'd find a couple of schools for me in the city. Um, 
I asked for one that was in a working class area, one in the middle class area. I asked them to select a couple of groups of about half a dozen young people, roughly equal female, male, and um, to select them not on the basis of their academic uh, testing or anything like that, but on simply being interested and able, willing to talk. Um, sometimes we spoke in their own language, sometimes we spoke in English, and our colleague would translate for me. So this is an example here of a kind of opening discussion with a, a group I had in a dense in Denmark. And it starts off with three girls explaining that they are Danish or Danish, but got a Scottish grandfather. Um, at which point, um, Julius popped up and said, oh, you're all saying you're Danish, not European, you're all nationalist. And the others thought that was quite hilarious. Um, clearly didn't believe it, neither did Julius. Um, and then we got some more interesting continuing as well. And Evel here um, actually has got, it's actually by descent, three quarters German, but he feels Danish. Um, and Lily says, when I feel, as I say, I feel Danish, it's not like I belong to the country. I can move anywhere I wanted to. And Hussein now comes in, he's from, from Palestine, or his parents are from Palestine, but he's born locally, raised locally. It doesn't feel quite as Danish as the other. I feel a bit of both more European than Danish, just like the same culture as Arabic. Hussein goes on to say that it's not really a clash of cultures. It's an advantage. You take the best of both cultures. So without me asking anything more than can you describe yourselves, we're getting all these terms coming up from this particular group about feeling Danish, Danish and other things, having other identities as well, um, about having mixed origins, about mixed cultures, um, about Europe um, and so on. And Julius comes and becomes quite anthropological in one sense. Um, he's aware, he says, that um, being Danish is a social construction that arrived in the 19th century. I know mean, he made in history books, obviously. Um, and you wouldn't have nationalities in the sense you have now. And I, I want to look away from nationalities. Um, Cecile makes an interesting point that your nationality only becomes really important to you when you're abroad. And sometimes when you're at home, it makes you feel secure, but she feels European as well. And interestingly, because of the rules and stuff that unite us in Europe. So that was one kind of um, expression of their sense of belonging to a particular country or belonging to a country and other things as well. Um, Nationalities can also be seen very much as a matter of chance. A lottery um, depends on where you're born. Um, and sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're unlucky. The Tsar says the same thing in Macedonia. Um, Macedonians, but not by choice, unlucky. I wish I was a Danish. Um, and there are competing constructions of what they mean um, by the country, whether they see the country as being a nation or a state. Most of them saw it in terms of statehood or nationhood. Um, so they would often put forward, more frequently put forward ideas that they um, saw themselves as having some origin in the state. They could be grateful being in a state um, because they got particular attributes, particularly in some of the Western European countries, um, but that wasn't being nationalist. And nationalism to them meant often being racist, um, a, a movement that defines who is Swedish and who is not Swedish. And others in the same group said they refused to be proud of Sweden as a whole, proud of where they grew up and their family and the areas they live in, but not Sweden as a whole. It's, it's weird, Christian says, to talk about Sweden as being one's country. And the nationalistic movement in Sweden at the time was being something they wanted to not identify with, to become important they identify with something else and not to identify with where they live or where other people are from. Others, though, were much more essentialist. Um, is Kranko a Serbian young man um, living in Denmark? And he says he's not Danish. You can feel Danish if you're not born in Denmark, he says, but he feels Serbian because it's in his blood. He's connected with Denmark because he lives here. And that essentialism came forward 
that sense of the of the mythical nation state um, came forward from a number of people, from a number of sources. Here's Janakali in Turkey. Um, to be Turkish depends on your racial blood lineage. Um, even more precisely, Khan says, the Turkish man is a person who can sacrifice his life for his country, and the Turkish woman is a supporter of her man. Janakali is a particularly interesting location. It's um, on the Bosphorus opposite the Dardanelles, on the Dardanelles. So it's surrounded by huge memorials to, to, to the Dardanelles campaign um, and makes a living the city itself on the basis of tourists coming to coming to see the, um, the Dardanelles from um, particularly from the Australian New Zealand community. And in Belgium, Hassan says he thinks he's Belgian because he was born here and I grew up here, but in blood, I'm always Moroccan. I'll never forget that. And that notion of um, blood lineage, in a sense, comes up also with the impressions of the way that the minority Russian community in some of the Baltic states behaves. It's in their temperament, it's in their blood, and they can't do anything about it. Constructionism, though, was much more popular as an idea. And the idea that you don't define people by nationality isn't what gives people their identity. And it changes according to the context, context in which you find yourself, a much more common expression of young people. Nationality is to be born in a particular place, but that's not important to who you are from Zagreb. And the notion of the nation state is declining says Rudolf in Hungary. There's also an ethnoculturalist view that says it's to do with culture. Um, this was interestingly coming from Turkey here, from central Anatolia. Um, he'd been on a school visit to Italy and he'd only seen one Italian flag in the garden of the school, nothing on the streets, nothing in the parks. And anyone who's been to Turkey knows that one of the characteristics of Turkish culture is that they, they put the Turkish flag everywhere. Um, it's flying on every, not every building, but most buildings, every state building, certainly. And they also have vast um, mountainside panoramas constructed of stones of the Turkish flag um, or painted on the, on, on the mountainside. Um, so the culture of the flag becomes very important there. And from around Europe, cultural traditions are associated with the nation um, and with history. A lot of the Baltic states young people felt they were particularly nationalistic, particularly apropos the construction of their nation, their state in opposition to the Turkish dominance that they'd had in the Ottoman Empire period. And that continues in different ways now in other parts of the Balkans, um, when this is a Croatian young woman, um, a young man, um, has a special charm as a nation, he says, when we play against fo football against Serbia and we win. Um, and football matches there are highly, highly uh, country focused, state focused, nationalistic focused. But uh, more common is this notion of convergence, something I don't think about usually about the nation, and it's something that's generational. Um, it's, it seems something that belongs to older people. Young people have the net, internet, social media, but we are globalized, they say. We're young people and we get news from everywhere, and we, young people, are less nationalistic, and nationalism is be decreasing because of that. Parents and grandparents, much more often nationalistic than we are. We don't share the old Swedish songs and stuff. Um, and from Spain, we get the family histories coming through um, of nationalism and its meaning in the Spanish Civil War. And they had different ideas with parents and grandparents. Um, and similarly in, in, um, in Finland here, um, people fighting for their country 70 years ago. We haven't seen that, of course. They feel differently when they've seen people die for their country. Um, and in the rural areas, another aspect comes through. Um, city dwellers, young people, tended to see um, the racism and immigrants, the conservatism of older people 
creating nationalism and doing that in the countryside much more than in the towns. Um, so nationalists arising in both the rural areas of, 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 of Sweden and of, of, um, of the Netherlands. And in Austria too, it's the little villages where old people live and farmers and also the young people there as well. They want people, they don't think of the whole. And this notion of racism is quite um, embedded in the notion of being tied to nationalism and tied to being people who lived in an era before there was much, as, as much global interaction. They feel more nationalistic that they're being invaded. Nationalism is a bad word in Sweden, says so Torre, um, as a 15 year old. It's about othering other people and seeing the values that you share and other people don't have. And one quite common kind of othering of this nature was, was Europeans feeling European because Euro Europe, they thought, had some commonality of political values. Wilfred here um, talks about um, the difference between a European sense of belonging to a country and what he sees as an American USA sense of belonging to a country both democratic, but also sometimes nationalistic and religious. And the people there are way more nationalistic than here. Russia, another country that's seen as being conservative and nationalistic. And people feeling, young people often feeling that they are anti-nationalist. Doesn't describe who you are at all, all are. I'm Danish, I have a Danish passport, but I'm not very internationalism. And there are some contextual variations in this. Older people having a sense of belonging together, bound because they survive together, things together, particularly strong in the Visegrad countries, um, Poland, Czechoslovakia, um, Hungary, um, where there was particularly, they were the bloodlands that Timothy Snyder talks about in the Second World War. Um, and they have experiences like when people want to make them not Hungarian. And the Poles in particular um, still remember the divisions, the divisions of Poland and still talk about that. Um, and they feel emotional about that. But they also see that can be something that's um, perhaps egotistical and certainly something that's more common amongst parents and particularly grandparents. Two particular instances are of what I would call reframing nationalism, what Brubecker calls reframed nationalism um, in the Baltics where there were a large Russian minorities um, and there are also a growing number of young people who have dual origin Russia and Latvian, and having to try and find some way between that and not defining themselves as not being Russian, even though that they are half Russian um, in one sense, um, but also not necessarily Latvian. And the same applies in the Balkans, where the breakup of Yugoslavia um, means there's a lot of talk still going on um, between Slovenes and Croats and Serbs, um, often quite antagonistic. Um, Serbia is a bad country because of the wars. Um, parents are mad with other nationalities. So there are problems in schools. And these, these uh, are um, two, two young people in Slovenia who are of Serbian origin and then Radosh here in, in Croatia, um, who was born independent Croatia. He says, doesn't affect me anyway at all. And often, in particular in the Balkans, young people who actually have got parents who were directly involved in the conflict um, 25 years ago um, and talk about it still and part of their family, direct family narrative. Um, and particular context like in, in, in Norway, um, where the 
racist killings that took place in 2013, um, very important to all these young Norwegians. Um, and the way that that gave them a sense, some sense of a solidarity in the country, um, the way they behaved. And these, both these young people as actually new people who, who had been involved in the day. One of them was um, out of the country because on a holiday by luck, and she would have been there had she not um, been out of the country. And the other was with a woman working in a shop on Saturday um, whose, whose daughter was at the camp and survived. But very direct emotional appearance. And also um, another sense of othering here in terms of the values. If it happened in North America, he would have been got the death penalty, but here we treat people with respect. Um, so young people, young Europeans in this age cohort at this time were critical of the concept of a national identity. They thought it was something that was about the far right, often older people, often rural people, but they did identify with their country in some ways. Um, sometimes with the state structures, health, welfare provision, um, and they contrasted it with the US, which didn't have that in the same way, um, or with, the, with Russia, seen as being less democratic. Um, so this identity they had though was being sometimes a matter of chance, a lottery, and rarely an essentialized construction of their national characteristics. Um, and the identities they, they struck up in terms of political entities were a quite wide spectrum of political locations, local to global. Europe was an entity for many young people instrumentally, for work, for education, for so on. They could they could be, actually work for them and um, e make it easier. But as the discussions went on, Europe was seen much more as a location for particular values and rights that were shared, um, especially rights that were in, still in dispute. Um, women's rights, LBGT rights, refugee, migrant rights, anti-racism. These were the things that fired them up and got them to talk about the differences between their sense of identity with their nation, with older people, with, with Europe, um, with other parts of the world. So nationalism is not being constructed as a mythic story. It's no longer needed as that kind of narrative, but as, a, um, as more of a political construct, a bit hazy. Not a lot of talk about the European Union as such or the Council of Europe, um, but a community defined by shared values, political and social, around rights, a fluid community. At times it was fractious, and it was something that was different from being either a nation or a state. But it did have some of the elements of this imagined community Benedict, Benedict Anderson was, writes about. Um, this just to find, end up with is this young 12 year old woman in Krakow who describes how she feels European. Everywhere you go, you're surrounded by your friends, people from the same group. I can go anywhere, any country, and they know you're from Europe. They don't know you, but they know you. You're like a distant relative. Being European means that everywhere you have neighbors. In Europe, everyone has awareness. They know about each other, which, where each country is. And that seems to me almost to encapsulate um, much of Benedict Anderson's arguments uh, from, from the, the 1980s. So that's, uh, that's my piece. Thank you very much for listening to me and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much, Alistair. I mean, I was fascinated just by the description of the methodology there and how many participants, 2000 participants, which is kind of mind boggling um, for, for such a qualitative study that you know this was not a 2000 people filling in a questionnaire, but 2000 people participating in group discussion. So I, I found that method really fascinating. And, you know, I think young people often get a bad press and we're often very critical of the kind of apolitical stance of young people. But as we've seen recently with climate change activism, with Black Lives Matter, etc., with the Me Too, you know, when when young people come out and, and protest, you know, it really does give us a sense of hope <laughs> for the future. So it's it's about kind of harnessing that, I suppose, and, you know, are all young people in every generation like that? And do young people just gradually become more conservative as they get older? Or, you know, let's let's look at that sort of through a, a life course perspective. But you've given us so much food for thought there. 
Thanks very much, Alistair. So I would now like to uh, turn to the audience who've been, some of whom have been typing questions in the chat. Um, I've got two, three that I can start off with. Um, Julius has got his hand up. So you can either put your hand up or you can type your questions in the chat. The first question that I can see there is from Donato. And this, I think, was a question you were um, bringing to Angelos, a question about populism, trying to define it in my head and trying to make a pattern. Another common denominator I found is the presumption of guilt, something like the people have decided before a tribunal against the rule of law, since the tribunal and the justice itself is part of the elite. We don't trust the elite. So Angelos, would you like to um, answer Donato's question um, that's there in the chat? Yeah, uh, thanks. I actually saw the question before and I spent quite some time uh, thinking about it. Uh, I think uh, the question touches upon a pretty important, uh, touches on a, on a pretty important uh, point, which is, and as we see currently in Poland and Hungary, which is the uh, problematic relationship between populism and um, and the rule of law. Uh, the idea being that populism generally has problems with institutions which it perceives as being kind of counter-majoritarian as it were, right? So populism is instinctively in favor of the majority of the people because it considers that the will, the political will must be embodied in the will of the majority in the will of the in the will of the many so this creates a bit of a problematic relationship between populism and the notion of rights or human rights uh, for example or populism and courts uh, and we see that in the rhetoric of many we see that in the rhetoric of many uh, populists now of course there is a flip side argument to that which is that we can say that in many cases liberal institutions necessarily embody some dimensions of pre-existing structures of uh, pre-existing political power and hierarchies, right? Uh, what I find really interesting is the um, increasing debate coming from the left, or you could say the populist left in the United States, which is challenging particularly the notion of uh, the Congress, uh, the, the Senate, or the Electoral College, or the Supreme Court. Uh, here, there you see this idea that these are institutions that have become so out of tune with American society because they entrench conservative minorities as majorities, basically, that they stifle the will of the people. Mm, you know, the, the idea, for example, that the Republicans have, are winning presidencies without winning the popular vote. But then you can switch, switch that argument and say, well, don't all democracies need a certain kind of safeguard against the decisions made by the majority? So in reality, I don't really have a, an answer here. You know, it's also in more kind of sensitive questions, you know, thinking about, for example, the Me Too movement or the Black Lives Matter, right? Um, there's this idea that we cannot really resolve such issues just by recourse to the power of the many, to the power of the street. Uh, you know, conservatives go like, ah, you know, and, you know more mob rule and stuff. Um, on the other hand, we do know that even popular majorities have to be channeled through some institutional processes. So I think the main point here to evaluate populism is that at which point do we see populism as uh, in, the, in its trajectory? We could say that populism perhaps goes through a cycle, and in its early point in the cycle, populism is democratized to some extent. So, you know, this idea that, you know, can we trust a justice system that we see time and time again not doing justice to various disenfranchised groups. There we need quote-unquote populism in that the people need to challenge this. But uh, are we at a point where someone says we don't trust the justice system because it gives too many rights to minorities, therefore the many have to take power in their own hands? Again, uh, I'm just putting in this, those ways. Perhaps you, you, you know what I am alluding to, but it really, this itself, this speech act of claiming that something is good populism or bad populism is itself subject to political contestation, right? So there really, there really is no answer to that. Uh, to, part of, I wouldn't say that it's fully subjective. We can have some criteria to whether we can see some virtuous things versus some dangerous things there, but a lot of stuff falls in the in-between gray territory, I would say. 
Yeah, and indeed we had the same thing here with Brexit when when Boris Johnson dis um, what's the word cancelled Parliament, shut down parole, Parliament, parole, 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 parole Parliament. Yeah. Yes, a word we learned temporarily, and obviously mm -hmm. I've not forgotten. Paroled Parliament and uh, was was very displeased when the law lords um, got involved and uh, and challenged him on that. So we can see that getting played out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another question here from um, Mohammed, which is for you again, Angelos. Uh, what is your comment and possible advice on how academics can respond to the non-ideological pure populism that is questioning liberal democracy through the great reset manifesto that perceives science and the greater role of the state as a threat to liberal democracy and freedom. Mm. So I had a conversation yesterday actually where we were talking about threats to academic freedom and academic freedom mm. of speech which we are beginning to see from some members of Boris Johnson's government. So mm. this is not just something that's happening far away but happening here in, in this country too. So Angelos, do you have a response for Mohammed? Yeah, I think so if I understand correctly, <laughs> the Great Reset manifested is this idea, there's this kind of uh, online conspiracy theory percolating that, uh, you know, the pandemic is an opportunity by globalist elites to create the Great Reset and therefore lockdowns are part of a plan to kind of, you know, reshape society, restructure society, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but I think what uh, Mohammed is referring to is this idea that uh, you do see, I think what he's pointing at is, and again, something that is, both, is difficult to disentangle conceptually any more empirically, is this idea at what point is populism a genuine reflection of emancipatory feelings and at what point is populism basically a top-down strategy that tries to harness popular support for specific interests. And again, it is very, very difficult to see uh, at what point one or not is not the other. Uh, for example, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the point about whether lockdowns are good or bad. I don't think that we should conceptually de deny the fact that there can be a genuine resentment against lockdowns as a sense of something that is top-down imposed and makes life difficult for people for whatever reason. Just as we shouldn't be uh, be blind to the fact that an anti-lockdown rhetoric can be used, for example, by powerful pro-business interests, right? Both can be true. And I think ultimately the populism that we observe around us politically is really the point where genuine feelings from below and strategies from above kind of meet and intertwine somewhere in between and then they kind of find expression in the political in the political field. My message overall is that I don't think anything any agenda should be a priori uh, cancelled because we consider it populist and stuff just as though not any agenda should be a, a priori uh, accepted because it represents a genuine political grievance because then always the next step is how do we channel this through our institutional understandings of how democracy should uh, function so you know it's of course it's a very it's a very delicate debate which itself the out, out the outcome of this is always an outcome of political struggle ultimately Thank you, Angelos. Um, I can see that, Julius, you've had your hand up for ages. Your hand must be tired from being held up all this time, as it would be in the olden days. So, <laughs> Julius, would you like to turn your microphone on and ask your question yourself? Uh, good afternoon, Louise. I'm not sure if you can hear me properly. Uh, yes, we can hear you perfectly. Uh, excellent. So, thanks a million to both Angelos and uh, Alistair. And, uh, Alistair, I, I suppose my question is for you. Uh, and uh, I appreciate you sharing your, your extens extensive uh, qualitative research and, and also the fact that your research seems to allow for heterogeneity among young people. So, and perhaps a bit of a clarification note before I ask my question that Alistair's research participant, uh, Julius from Denmark, is basically not me. <laughs> <laughs> We were wondering, I think, especially as your hand went up straight oh, away yeah, no, when Julius was cited. <laughs> let's call it a misunderstanding. They're all, they're, they're all pseudonyms, all pseudonyms the whole way through. <laughs> Apart from Julius, which is real. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could, um, Alistair, sh shed a bit of light on uh, whether how the young people speak about nationhood is connected to uh, a young person's sense of belonging. And I have a little bit of a sub question for you as well. So based on my own research, some young people prefer to refer to themselves in terms of local 
neighborhood identity. So for example, they may refer to themselves in relation to a London borough or, or maybe a, a London, uh, the, the city of London, for example, uh, rather than uh, referring to themselves in terms of um, citizenship or, or being a member of a nation state. And I suspect that uh, this may be more common within ethnically diverse areas. Uh, you're less likely to refer to yourself in terms of being a member of a nation state. So I don't know if you, you could um, uh, relate yes. this to, to your own uh, research. Very interesting, and, and, and thank you for that. Um, heterogeneity is an important point. Um, both of the population I was talking to and of the views that they expressed. And I think there's a there's an assumption that that's very common that we expect people to form groups to be in groups and to groups to have a viewpoint that's that can be expressed in that way. And what I was uncovering, I suppose in a way, that not, not uniquely in doing this, um, is that people have different expressions of loyalty to different kinds of institutions that actually they don't compete but they come to the fore in different contexts. So as the context of a discussion changes, as the lens of looking at your own locality or your own country or of Europe changes, then you express your identity in, in different ways. Not that it's contradictory, but it's complementary. And it's contingent upon what's going on around you in that context right now. Um, so, Yes, I think the, 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 the more heterogeneous the population itself, the, 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 the livelier the discussion and the more tolerant the discussion. The, 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 the tolerant discussions came from, from mixed groups. The, the intolerant stuff that I got, which wasn't a lot, but when I did get it, it tended to be very much from, from quite small communities, you know, populations in a city or a town of less than 4,000 or so. Um, and the big ones, it got very, very mixed. Um, but as 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 they, they it wasn't a belonging type of conversation. Um, it was identifying with in a non-belonging way um, of being able to flexibly move around um, these different groups depending on the context, and that gives me some hope that the data I generated wasn't simply based around a particular moment in time, though it was clearly, but the fact it was so clearly located at a particular moment in time means that talking to the same group a year later or even a week later would give you a different focus of conversation, but would give you the same um, values coming through, merely expressed in a very um, way that was tied to what was going on right at that time. Uh, so, so many times um, the talk focused upon things that were happening, had happened in the previous week, month or so. Um, that was the thing that generated the discussion, the argument about things that are going on right now, um, um, right to that, that morning. You know, this morning I heard on the radio the mayor of Calais talking about he didn't want the refugees in the camps in Calais. Um, this morning. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a, a, it's a ability to take the immediate context and to weave your story about who you are um, around events happening right now, events happening both locally and more distant, um, that provides this, um, this, this multiplicity of views. And I'm, I feel quite optimistic about young people um, in the future. I think they are a different cohort. Um, in, in the way a different generation um, than, than the earlier cohorts and, and I could have a long discussion about um, whether people's views change over time and what kind of views change over time. Um, yeah. Thank you and, and of course uh, Julius himself gave a very interesting paper in this seminar series a few months ago on his research on young people in Tottenham and that sense of having a very local Tottenham identity. And I think for myself, I've also done research with young people in London and it's that kind of multi-scalar identity where it can be a very local identity like Tottenham or a London identity or a sort of sense of a transnational identity, a European identity or an affiliation to some country of origin of their parents or their grandparents and how all of these things can exist simultaneously 
and it's often that they kind of come in and out of focus depending on events and so I suppose it's that sense of threat whether it's Brexit or the pandemic or some kind of external threat which can then heighten a particular identity and I think I felt very optimistic listening to your participants Alistair but I suppose the challenge would be if God forbid there were a war or some big external threat would a sense of national identity then suddenly take on a salience and a significance that at the moment it doesn't seem to have and I suppose that's the big challenge about how those identities can be quite fluid and aspects of them can come in and out of focus at different points in time. I don't know if you have a thought about that. Yes, that's 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 true, and they and they can come into focus, and they they do come into focus at at times of particular stress. Um, that doesn't. It seemed to me that didn't persist very long after the event. No, it didn't persist more than ten years. The 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 the, the, the anti the Croatian Serbian conflict was 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 dated. Um, and it gets expressed partly through family stories being told and um, being remembered, but often very positively um, as, in terms of international cooperation. I mean, the way that um, young Spaniards talked about the Civil War and how their grandparents talked about it and how they were moving on, very much moving on from that and seeing that as be, being the past. The way in which young Germans um, talked about um, family migration after the Second World War um, and how that made them feel very welcoming to refugees. A lot of the talk about why refugees were welcome in Germany was you know, my family in the 19, late 1940s. And we forget, you know, a million, a million refugees in 19, 2016. Um, compare that with 10 million German refugees in 1945. 10 million at least on the road in that three or four years after the end of the war. Um, and that family narrative gets embedded into the cultural values they've got in those cases in Spain in positive ways. Yeah, thank you, Alistair. I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I have a question that I'd like to ask both speakers about a very topical issue. Um, it might sound like I'm totally obsessed with Brexit, which I am, uh, but I was going to ask both of them about Scottish independence. But before I do, I see that Donato has his hand up. So I'm going to come to Donato and then I'm going to ask both of you to maybe also think about a Scottish independence. Donato, would you like to turn your mic on? Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you oh, fine. Uh, yeah, my question is for both of professors, because obviously this, uh, this topic is uh, intertwined. And first of all, I was thinking, uh, historically speaking, uh, um, right. Sorry. Histori historically speaking, now we are thinking about uh, what's to be, uh, what is to be European. But Europe uh, was born like in 1993, so it's pretty, it's pretty young. And what about the same process that uh, to be American was? What I mean is maybe the sense of to be European. Uh, we can understand it in 300 years, but only when uh, some people want to social engineering, something like that, and uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to create the United States of Europe or whatever it is in 100 years, 200 years, etc. It's something like why the American feel together, because 100, 300 years, uh, no, 200 years, sorry, uh, they stay together, they have a common enemies, they created a common culture. So can we create a common European culture? And the other question is, now, to think about uh, now, the problem of to don't have a European uh, commonality is the opposite, the populism. Uh, because something like uh, the European is perceived as a, uh, for the populist as an enemy. And what's the another common denominator between populism, between people? Uh, we uh, we are not looking for answer. We are looking for an enemy. Something like uh, if the state doesn't function is uh, for the immigrants, for the Europe, etc. How can we uh, try to invert this uh, this perceiving of the people? Because I do perceive that 
some, uh, how can we explain to the people, look for the answer, not look for the culprit? So I hope I made myself clear on this. On this end. Yes, thank you, Donato. So I can see Anna, Anna Patricia has also typed a comment. So perhaps you could answer Donato first and then we can come to Anna Patricia as well. Uh, I'll, um, Angelos, would you like to start with Donato's remarks yeah, about I mean, the United States of Europe? Well, so I have a bit of a problem with the notion of a European identity uh, in that I think it is being caught a bit in the it is quite a bit, so there's, the, there's this demand or expectation or hope of, for some kind of a mass European identity to be developed, which, however, should pledge allegiance to a highly technocratic, depoliticized, removed project such as the EU, right? Uh, so paradoxically, I would say that if there, are, if there ever were some kind of a pan-European identity to, to be developed, I personally think, based on history, I would expect it more to be created on some kind of uh, anti-EU moment rather than just being created from above by the EU. I find this paradoxical because if we look at the history of nationalism in the 19th century, of course there's the, the standard analysis by Benedict Anderson or by uh, Hobsbawm about how nationalism was essentially a top-down uh, move that was created by states or imposed by states or led by state authority, but uh, there is the earliest stage of nationalism nationalism in their first half of the 19th century, where nationalism was in effect the populism of its time. It was essentially mass democratizing movement moving against all the residual Middle Eastern, Middle, sorry, Middle, Eastern, Middle Ages or uh, kind of even pre-modern structures of power such as monarchies, empires and aristocracies. Now if we see that, and then of course that popular effervescence was harnessed by state authorities or new political elites depending on on the dispensation in different parts in different parts of Europe, uh, by which I point that um, you know notions of European identity are very interesting. I do think that there is some kind of emerging European identity. I'm not sure though to what extent the existence of something called the EU, uh, which by the way has also been uh, defined or has also been analyzed in the past through a so-called neo-medieval perspective. In other words, the EU is the Holy Roman Empire or the aristocracy or kind of the, you know, the societas civilis of our time. This means that if there ever were to be some kind of a popular movement created in the EU that would resemble the effervescence of nationalism, it would have to be directed against what lies on top, and that would be the EU. So that's kind of my, my point is that uh, even something that looks as regressive today as nationalism had its origins in a very emancipatory democratic idea in the first half of the 19th century. And I don't think we should forget that, you know, we cannot expect something as technocratic as the EU to generate genuine um, genuine popular feelings. My pro-European Christian democratic self, I would say, in a different life, actually wants nothing, would, li would like for the EU to have nothing to do with the people, because that, that was not its purpose, that was not the purpose for which it was uh, created. Let it be to do its job and keep popular politics away from it. Yes, uh, thank you for, for making a, a positive remark about nationalism. As an Irish person, I mean, for us, nationalism was always about anti-colonialism. And I think, you know, that sort of way of, of approaching nationalism as a, as a decolonizing project, I think, shouldn't be forgotten either. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Alistair, did you want to come in on Donato's point or should we move on to some other points? Just briefly to say that I sure. think that we... we that the views of what constitutes nations and nationalism is constantly changing. Um, and that's um, the, the essentialist view that there is something essentially about Hungary that makes Hungary Hungary or Ireland that makes Ireland Ireland um, is based on a particular sense of narrative that, that is, is, is um, not entirely fictional, but it, but it is it is a political construct and should be seen as such. And that um, I'm very 
taken by, I'm, I'm still reading it, but Linda Colley's recent book, new book, The Gun, The Ship, The Pen, um, makes some quite cogent analysis of the way in which constitutions and states emerge. Um, that's, it's, that's very thought provoking. Say no more than that. Yes, yes, I would agree with you. And of course, often it was colonialism that constructed these nations in the first place, um, kind of then spawning a nationalist movement. And you could say the same about the US with Britain being that sort of, you know, colonizing enemy around which the US was able to coalesce. So, yeah, maybe Europe needs that kind of an enemy to, to spark some sort of loyalty. But let's not go there. So, um, Anna Patricia, you were making a remark about Portugal. Would you like? I'm just conscious that a lot of men have spoken, so I want to ensure some female voices as well. Did you want to to add to that point about Portugal, or was there a question? I'm putting her on the spot now. No, no, she she can't turn on her mic. Okay, that's fine. So if there aren't any other questions, could I come back to my question about Scottish independence? Be for a number of reasons. I mean, Scotland has has one of the youngest electorates. I believe that um, young people of 16 and 17 are now entitled to vote in Scotland. So if there is to be a referendum, it will be a very, very young electorate who will be making that decision. But of course, you know, that raises all sorts of issues around identity, around nationalism. Would we consider the Scottish independence and the SNP to be a form of populism? So in the remaining time, and, and I'm conscious that we are getting very close to the end, I would really like to hear both of your views on what potentially now is going to be a very big political issue in this country for the next few years ahead. Uh, Alistair, would you like to start? Well, yeah, as, 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 as um, I'm now emerging, I, I feel, as a half Scot, um, <laughs> Scottish father, and um, I, I, I am very conscious of the fact that should Scotland become independent, I could become Scottish as well as British or whatever left, left, left of Britain and get European Union citizenship through that, that link. Um, on, on your point, Louise, about the, the voting age, um, Scots can vote, young Scots, 16 can vote in local elections um, and in Scottish assembly elections, but not in national elections or in European elections, I believe. Um, that's still controlled by the, the UK state, um, effectively Boris. Um, and he will deny it to them for the, any referendum quite clearly, because if, if he did that, he'd be giving a probably quite a large majority to well, larger element of the majority to the Scots Nats. Um, I think it's part of, we, we need to see this as part of the, the, the wider problem of um, the state of the United Kingdom, which is a um, hundred years old last week um, as a state. Um, worth remembering that and the, the 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 rising talk of the of being four nations which i don't remember happening until somewhere around the 1990s until that no one thought, and everyone was very confused about what the uk was and what great britain was um and didn't really worry about it they all they all felt they talked the same thing but england was interutilized with britain with great britain with the uk um and no one really bothered about it. It's only only these peculiar people in, in Ireland that, that were concerned with it. Um, it always it's always bothered me because as, as, as with a Scottish father and an English mother, I can remember at 10 years old talking with kids in the playground about um, whether your, your nationality came from um, where you were born or who your parents were. And I could say it comes from both or can come from both and was in a minority at the time. Um, there's clearly um, a strong feeling in many Scots that they are not being truly represented in the UK Parliament, the UK government, um, because of the various um, cultural differences that are growing stronger. And those cultural sense issues are not, are not to do with, with, with traditions, they're to do with current cultures, current perceptions of, of the way in which people behave um, those kind of values rather than th th these historical myths um, um, and the, 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 the accounts in, in, in Ranger and Hobsbawm, the one by um, 
I remember that particular chapter now of Scottish nationalism is 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 very funny to read, um, to, to, to you know, the invention of Scottish, tradition, okay. of Scottish traditions. Um, but that's not Scotland, and uh, there's a clear cultural view emerging about the way in which Scotland needs to behave differently, does behave differently, and should be seen in that way. And I think there's a similar feeling emerging amongst Londoners. Um, so where this takes us in terms of the UK as a peculiar kind of institution, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I obviously feel deeply that I'm going to be involved in it in some way. <laughs> Yeah, re really interesting. And I completely agree with you about this notion of the four nations that suddenly appeared in our lingo a few years ago. And up until then, there'd been very little talk of any such thing as the four nations. So, yeah, I feel in some ways that was a little bit of a kind of throwing breadcrumbs to the to the other countries. Anyway, yes, Angelos, do you have views on the forthcoming potential forthcoming Scottish referendum? Well, our views are, are definitely the views decidedly of an outsider, so a double outsider in the sense that, you know, I live in the UK, obviously, but as Alistair said, I live in London, which I'm not sure how representative is of the rest of the UK, and I've only been in Scotland, I think, for a grand total of 48 hours, so I'm not sure. But and as an academic, I'm totally going to pontificate about something I don't know nothing about. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think the... My my outside perspective is that I don't think we can understand the rise of the SNP outside the overall framework of the rise of populism of the last decade, which again, it is, it is an interesting point also because in a very multi-level world that we live in, uh, dimensions of populism and nationalism can actually overlap in many different in many different ways, right? So what counts as inclusive discourse on the inside actually necessitates an exclusive discourse on the outside and vice versa. So I my I followed quite closely um, uh, the SNP campaign in 2014 and back then I could tell that there were many uh, populist elements to it. I'm not sure whether the SNP has normalized itself and therefore by definition also this thing has been downplayed a bit today but I would expect any referendum to have some populistic element at least in a sense of being directed against Westminster whatever that uh, whenever wherever that may mean which is not to say that the SNP internally of course shows to be a fairly inclusivist um, party. I'm not sure how inclusive it feels to unionists who live in Scotland, who feel that they suddenly may have to choose between different, uh, between different identities. Um, there's also seems to be this European, you know, a lot of, there's also this interesting irony whereby uh, a lot of unionists would uh, kind of be against independence in 2014 because it could kick Scotland out of the EU. Uh, whereas today the SNP puts forward the argument about staying in the EU through independence. So there's multiple identities going on there. And I think there's a lot of ad hoc political games being played about who is the system, who are the people, who is democracy, and whose identity should be, whose identity should be uh, respected. Um, I would just finish by saying that referendums, I think, my only point is, if you think that referendums are a bad idea for one topic, it's only consistent to think that they should be a bad idea generally. So that's my own, that's, that's, <laughs> the, only, that's the only way I'm going to close the, uh, as, again, as, an, as an outsider, I'm just going to close with this neutral uh, statement. Yeah, fascinating, bringing us right back to Brexit again. So Boris cannot have his cake and eat it too when it comes to, to referenda. Yes, brilliant point. What, what, so, what, what the yes. other way, work the other way as well, though. I mean, if you thought that having a over generally referendums are stupid, as many Remainers said in 2016, what makes other referendums better? You know, you know it works both ways. Well, as I said, I come from Ireland. We have a written constitution, so we have a referendum about once a year. I have remembered times when we've had several referenda in the same year. So, so yeah, yeah, it's um, you can't have it both ways. You either have to have them or you don't have them, but you can't pick and choose. Yeah, I completely agree with you. So I can see that people are sending messages that we're running out of time and they have to go. And it's just been absolutely fascinating. I have thoroughly enjoyed the session today. The two papers fitted together 
beautifully, coming from very, very different perspectives, but really complementing each other and raising such important and topical issues. And it's been fantastic to have you both here and to the audience. We had a very nice audience and very active audience, lots of uh, questions and very thought provoking questions. And in the chat at the moment, you can see the advertisement for our forthcoming also fascinating events. Um, as I mentioned, we've got two events coming up in May, two events in June, including a book launch on the 10th of June on climate change. And I really hope people will make a special effort to come to that. So thank you all very much for attending. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to Anna from the research office for a recording. And the recording will be available quite soon. And uh, you can then listen to it back or you can send it to your colleagues and students. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair, and thanks very much, Angelus. That was really, really fascinating. Very intellectually rich and engaging yeah. presentations. Yeah. So um, I think the recording, we should definitely make sure that we um, promote the recording.